the middle of a series called Scandalous, and that's what it's called, and we call it Scandalous because who could ever imagine a, a, a story, something I could tell you that there is a God who created all things, and his own precious expression of himself his own children rebelled on him and yet he pursued them he pursued them and he pursued them until he reconciled them to himself and he performed the reconciliation completely he covered every detail of it from top to bottom he covered the union that we have with Christ it's not based on our ability to behave anymore our conduct or our ability to stay away from a tree from now on we are one with our father forever because he gave his own son to die for us he gave his own son who's risen for us. So our sins were dealt with through his death, but we live with him eternally because he's alive today and he's alive in me. And it's such a scandalous thing that my God, that God Almighty, who needs nothing, and yet he wants to love me. He wants to express his wonderful unmerited favor to me. And it's such a scandalous thing. But we've been talking about that for a few weeks. And First Peter 1, 18 to 20 says we're redeemed. We've been redeemed. And we've not been redeemed by gold, civil, or other things. But what we've been redeemed by, what we've been brought back and fully into our rightful place as ruling citizens of the family of God, it's been done with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, without spot, the perfect lamb. And you see, today when they would inspect the sacrifice, today when they would bring that lamb. That lamb is a perfect sacrifice. And if the lamb is perfect, you are perfect. See, when they went to sacrifice the lamb, they never looked at the person who brought it. They didn't look at the person and say, is this your lamb? Well, you're a terrible person. No, they didn't look at the person. They looked at the lamb. And see, God's not looking at you and your ability, your failures, or your lack of whatever. God is looking at his son. And he's saying, because he's perfect, you are perfect. Isn't that great? It's really not about you. It's all about him. That's why it's so scandalous. It really is. He indeed, he was foreordained to do this before the foundation of the world, but he's been manifest in these last days. Smith Wigglesworth, one of my favorite quotes, he said, the Holy Spirit never brings condemnation. He always reveals the blood. If you got condemnation in your life, that's not from God because the Holy Spirit always comes and says, plead the blood, plead the blood. The blood, nothing can wash away my sin, only the blood. A fellow named Dick Mills, Dick Mills said this. He said, his blood is so powerful that to mention it in prayer is the equivalent of placing dynamite under Satan's fortifications and blasting them to pieces. <laughs> you know? So I tell you, you got the enemy trying to mess in any area of your life to say, the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Ba-boom. He has to respect the blood and respect the bloodline. Isaiah 43, 25 to 26, it says, I, even I, I, I mean, really, it's really me. I did it. I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, isn't that good? He did it. Did he do it for you? He did, actually did it for his own sake. I have delivered you and set you free for my own sake. I, I, for, to please myself, I have shed the blood of my own dear son who did it willingly. God made a deal with God for his own sake so that he did not have to consider your sins. Put me now in remembrance of this. He says, now listen, remind me about that. Not because he forgets, but you need to remind him. See, God's not forgetful that he's dealt with all your sins and your transgressions. He's not forgetful that he loves you and he set you free. He's not forgetful that he's never, ever offended by you. He's not forgetful, but we do. We begin to get dumbed down and say, you must be really annoyed with me by now. He says, no, put me in remembrance of this. Come on, let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. The Living Bible puts it this way. I, yes, I alone am he who blots away your sins, and it's for my own sake, and I will never think about them again. Oh, remind me of this promise of forgiveness, for we must talk about your sin. Plead your case for me forgiving you. Father, did you see that? I did. And remember this, that I've forgiven you, and I've done it for my own sake, and I've removed your sin far, far away. Bring it to him. we got to deal with that, and I've dealt with it, so never, ever try to figure it out on your own. Always come. Bring it to me, and my blood will abolish every single failure, every single grievance thing. I have already dealt for it and provided for you. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Listen now. Romans has 48 times it uses the word sin. Romans, 48 times Paul used the word sin in Romans. Two times he used it as a verb. 
Every other time, 46 times is a noun. Hamartia is a noun. Hamarto is a verb. Hamartia and hamarto. Uh, my pronunciation could be weird there because I don't know Greek very well except for the guy, Greek guy Gus who owns the pizza joint down the street. <laughs> but I know him. Look what it says. Therefore, just as through one man sin, say sin. Now that's the noun sin, all right? The noun. What is a noun? It's a person, place, or a thing. There is something called sin. Sin itself. Sin entered into the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. The verb. Hamart's who, hamart, there's hamartia and hamartiu. Probably murdered those, but anyways. I'm forgiven. <laughs> so there's sin the noun. Sin the noun is you have a condition. Sin, the verb is, you have conduct. How many know that you have a condition and you have conduct? Now, if you had diabetes, you would have a condition and your conduct then, because of your condition, means that you probably have to take insulin pills or insulin needles because you have a condition. So your conduct is shaped by your condition. If you get some other type, if you start losing your hair, you start to go get, you know, implants because that's what you do. <laughs> No, you don't. It's cool having no hair, isn't it? Amen. I don't know why I went there at all. I have no idea. That was really odd, actually, wasn't it? So strange. There's no condemnation. Amen. I don't even know why I went there. Anyways, there's a condition. There's a condition that, that manifests conduct. All right, there's a... Say condition. Conduct. There's a noun, sin, and there's sinned. So there's a sunny day. It's a sunny day out there. That's the condition. What are the conditions today? It's sunny and blue skies. You know, the sunny and blue skies is going to affect your conduct. Because of the sunny and blue skies, how many brought an umbrella with them today? No, because that would be stupid conduct on a sunny day. Right? So the conditions are wonderful. So boom. How many are looking forward to next week? It's, they say it might go up to 25 in the middle of the week. Those are fabulous conditions. I might put a pair of shorts on and my flip-flops. Woo! Now, four weeks ago, if I came with my shorts and flip-flops, you'd say, you're Jeff Jurisic. No, so... <laughs> that's an inside joke. Because Jeff wears shorts in the middle of winter. I don't know why. But anyways... But you see, you wear different things based on the condition. So your, your condition affects your conduct. If, you, if I flew down to Punta Cana, where people like to go, if I flew down to Punta Cana and I had a winter jacket with me because it was cold when I went to the airplane here in Canada, but then at Punta Cana, I kept coming down the pool in my parka. How are you guys doing? What's the deal with the parka? Well, it's It's January. You ain't in winter time anymore. You ain't in Canada. You're in Putagana. The conditions have changed. Because the conditions change, the conduct changes. And see, God created a beautiful sunny day. And then Adam came in and he blew it all up. He allowed brokenness and sin to enter the thing, so we got a rainy day. And because of the rainy day condition, there's rainy day conduct. And because of the rainy day, everybody wore rainy stuff. Because sin entered the world, everybody sinned. Everybody received a condition, and it affected everybody's conduct. Are you following me? Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus sent the second Adam in the same type as the first Adam, and what happened in the first Adam, one man made a mess of it, another man came, and he made it all right. In fact, he took it and made it better than it could ever be. So here's the thing. Do you understand the condition that you now possess? If you understand the condition you now possess, I don't wear my big, heavy, weighty cloth anymore. I don't wear my guilt and my shame and my condemnation anymore. I wear freedom. I wear joy. I use gentleness. I walk in kindness. And I walk in all those things because the condition that I had that caused me to sin, that condition has been removed. And I was a slave to sin, but now I am a slave to righteousness. Now, you know what? You can still come down to the pool in your parka. But guess what? You're still in Punta Cana. You're dressing like you're back in Canada, but you're in Punta Cana. Now, there's some Christians who still dress like you're lost in sin. You still dress like you're not the righteousness of God. That's why it says in Peter, or have you forgotten that you're cleansed from your past sin? And then you get bogged down in it and you start to get a mentality of it. But you know, no matter how poorly you behave, how many parkas or mucklucks you wear, you're still in the sunny days of Almighty God. 
You can't change where God has put you because he once and for all changed the conditions for you and you are now a slave to his righteousness. What's sad is sometimes slaves to his rights. That's why he said, now put me in remembrance of this. Is it done? Absolutely done. Do we still fall on our heads and wear a parka in sunny days? Sometimes we do. But then you just need to be reminded, what's, what's, with, what's with the parka? Yeah, what is with the parka? Well, I go to a church where they believe that, you know, sin was dealt with, but we still have parkas. Well, you're in a new church now. You don't have to wear the parka. You've been clothed in his righteousness alone faultless and blameless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I hope you got that. I'm just trying to, I'm trying, and I'm just trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Just to illustrate in ways that you might be able to make the connection because some people still get bogged down in that. 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Anyone who got on the plane and landed in Punta Cana is in a new location. You have been in Christ at once and for all. You were in Christ. You didn't put yourself in and you can't take yourself out. You are in Christ. Done. Anyone who belongs to him is a new person. The old life is gone. You don't revisit it every once in a while. It is gone. It is gone. What's happened now is a brand new creation, something that never existed before, now has taken its place. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So the master version was flawed, so God remastered mankind through Christ. The mastered version, Adam, was flawed, so he had to remaster a new version through Christ. Do you follow me? See, now Adam, because of the flaw, Adam, it says, created after his own kind. And Adam reproduced after his brokenness. So brokenness was a condition and a realm and a place that because of Adam, it says, because of Adam, all have sinned. But because of Jesus and his finished work on the cross, all have been made righteous. Not offered the opportunity to righteousness, but literally made righteous. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things passed away, behold. All things have become new. Amen. Amen. That's good stuff. All right. How many remember what that is? Remember that? Was? We were, Cheryl was opening up boxes, looking for stuff to bring to sip, snack, swap, or snip, swap, sing, or what? what? Sip, sip, swap, snack. Yes. So she was looking for stuff, found some of our old uh, tapes from our old uh, movie recorder and all kinds of stuff. And then she pulled out a bunch of CDs. And we used to record the services on CDs. And then we had these towers that you could shove the master CD in. When you put the master CD in the master slot, you could then hit the button and whoop, it would copy all of the others. All the others were made. And you know what they were called? They were called slaves. We'd have slave units that would all be slaves to the master. And they all were copied exactly as the master. And see, so you were a slave to sin, but now you're a slave to righteousness. Isn't that bizarre? What a, what a crazy way to say it, but that's what the Bible says. You literally, every day I wake up another day enslaved to right behaving. Woo! But you see, when we had a broken, when we had a, a CD that was flawed, we'd get people call back and say, there's something wrong with the CD I got from the sermon last week. It gets right to that point where Pastor Carl's saying, and the Lord said, <laughs> and it just goes weird. The Lord said, <laughs> So then we checked, we pulled out another one. Yeah, that one does it too. That one does it too. That one does it too. That one, we copied all these. They all did the same thing. So we went and got the master CD and went, oh my goodness, the master was flawed. And because the master was flawed, that flawed was passed on to every single copy. What is God going to do with all these copies? Burn them. Toss them out. Get rid of them. No, he's not going to do that. You know what he's going to do? He's going to take all those broken copies and he's going to run a remaster. And he's going to run a remaster through the finished work of the cross and the resurrection of Christ. And he's going to run a new master. So that every single one of us, just as Adam, who was the father of all who had sinned, Jesus is now the father. We have a new bloodline. We have a new bloodline. And the bloodline is the righteousness of Christ. So now because he remastered, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. None of us are flawed anymore. Romans 6, 10, and 11 says, For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. So therefore, not only did he die, but you died. Point to your neighbor and say, you died. You already died because when Christ died, you died with him. You died once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, say likewise. 
Likewise, he died, he's alive. Likewise, reckon yourself, which is now consider yourself, just accept it, reckon it so that you died to sin and you are alive to God. Isn't that great? And how did that happen? Reckon it so. How complicated is that? Likewise, reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. How many people sinned really good? How many people like right over the top, really good sinners? I was a good sinner. I said, you know, if there was a class for sin, I'd have got an A. I'm telling you. You know what I'm so glad about? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Wow. And, and you know, the, the, Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for much more abounds, it's hyper. Hyper. Hooper. It's where we get the word hyper. Grace hyper abounds. I've had people say, you know, Pastor Carl, I hear your church is a little into the hyper grace. I go, absolutely, aren't you? Well, you have to be careful of the hyper grace. I go, why? It's all over the Bible. Because we're a biblical church, aren't you a biblical church? Oh. <laughs> like their grace, you know, there's a place where sin goes hop high enough that grace doesn't quite match. But you know what? If sin abounds, grace, whew. If sin is like a mountain, grace reaches to the sky. He's got it all covered, got it all grace. And look what it says. It says, grace abounded so that as sin reigned in death, even so, so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. First John 3, 9. Whosoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Say his seed. His seed. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. All right, let me show you this picture right here. You ready? I see a hand. What's going on with that hand? What are you doing? Are you giving me the clock already? Holy Mackinac. Kelly, am I, is, the, is it time? No? Kelly, see, who, I'm conflicted. Cheryl's whacking her arm. You're saying no. You're saying go? Thank you. Thank you. Priest. Man. Tell you, we got to have a special meeting later to pray for Pastor Cheryl. <laughs> she's got she's got a, a, a bit of a nervous twitch. <laughs> got to deliver her from that. I'm telling you, freaks me out. You know. All right, I'm gonna, I am. I'm almost. I'm almost done. All right. So right here, that's a stallion. That's the name of this. It's it's an Andalusian stallion. That's the type of stallion. Colombian Falls, Montana. Five nine 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 twelve is the number of him. If you want to stud him, I don't want to explain that to you. But, anyways, <laughs> but if you want to breed with that stud right there, it's going to cost you eighteen hundred dollars. Now, there's some that will stud for like $200,000, $300,000. If you want somebody in the line of secretariat, you know, you're going to pay hundreds of thousand dollars. But you know what? Secretariat and his offspring have won millions of dollars at the racetrack. So, you know, people go after that person. Why? Because of the bloodline. Because they know there's something in that bloodline that that horse breeds fast horses. So if you want a fast horse, you go to a bloodline that bleeds, breeds fast horses. Horses, are you getting it? Are you following me? All right, right there. Look at look at that. Oh, let's. Oh, 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 oh. Wow, I'm actually missing one. I don't know where one went. I had a, I had a great big a great big bull, but he disappeared. It, Cheryl must have cut him out. Anyways, <laughs> here's a superior. This superior litter was sired by our import champion. The dogs are fifteen hundred dollars a piece because they are sired by Enzo von Ivanhaus. <laughs> That's cheap for a Rottweiler, I think. You know, that was, a, that was a few years ago. But, but you see, they're showing where does that dog... How many have bought a dog? How many bought a dog? How many checked out where did the dog come from? And you wanted to know the line. You wanted to know the history because you want to know if the disease had been bred out or if the whole line has bad hips. I don't want to pay a million dollars for a hip replacement like I did a few years later. People say, my dog costs $1,500. I go, my dog costs $15,000. Two hip surgeries. I was like, Lord have mercy. I said, there's some fast moving cars out there. Maybe we could just... Anyways, let's not revisit that. Let's not revisit that. That was awful. Wasn't that awful? Oh my goodness. Lord, see, I just, I just moved back into winter. I forgot it's summer. You know, but anyways, uh, all right. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23 
I've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. I've been born again of not corruptible seed, of, but of incorruptible seed. Say seed. Seed. All right. All right. It's the seed of God. And what he means is the, he, means the, he means the seed of God. That's what he means. Okay. 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ is born of God. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So I just had to put that, that really good picture there. We had all the other studs on there, so I had to put our stud on there. <laughs> Pastor. Ah. You know, we've been redeemed by the plushest blood of Jesus. We've been re, it says, you have been born again from that incorruptible seed. And that's why it says those who are born again, his seed is in you. Your DNA has shifted. Everything about you has changed. It's changed your nature, your conduct, your character. Everything has shifted because you've been born again. That person who existed before who was a constant failure, he's gone. You don't have to behave like him anymore because you've been re-engineered, remastered, reconstructed through the seed of Christ himself. You are in the bloodline of a champion and you are a champion and you are a slave to righteousness. You can't do anything except man manifest God's intention and purpose for your life every day because that's who you are and you didn't do it Jesus did it and how do you get it manifest in your life simply believe see that's the offensive part the offensive part is how do I get it done simply believe you don't have to take 20 righteousness courses. You just have to believe that something shifted in me when I accepted Jesus and it radically transformed my life. I've been remastered. There's no more scratches in who I am. There's no more, hey, baby. <laughs> that's gone. I've been remastered. I'm perfect. Some people have a problem with that. I'm, I'm perfect. No, you are what you say. It says you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth unto righteousness. So there's got to be that faith thing, and that's faith. Believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. Because if you say it with your mouth, your heart don't believe it. There actually is a metaphysical disengagement. Believe it in your heart. Say it with your mouth. I am who God says I am. First John 4, 17 again. In this union and fellowship with him, in this union and fellowship, which is intimacy, the seed of God has impacted my life. Love is completed and perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. I have confidence. In, how many are looking forward to the day of judgment? Well, this says you can have confidence on the day of judgment. You can be bold when you see Jesus face to face. I hope I did good enough. When we get to that judgment thing, I hope everything's okay. I, I think I did my best down there, so I, I hope after the fire hits me, there's something left. <laughs> Settle down a lot of you believe that. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you are perfect in every way, complete. It has perfected us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment with assurance and a boldness to face him because, listen to this, because as he is, so are we in this world. Please take your seats, take your seats. I'm still scared I'm not doing good enough, Pastor. I'm still scared Jesus won't accept me. I'm still scared even though he saved me, I haven't done that good. I'm still scared that on the day of judgment, I might not make it. Rubbish. Because of what he did for his own name's sake. He has made himself one spirit with you, not in the future, not in the sweet by and by, but right now, because of his righteousness, I face judgment without any fear, because as he is, how is he? Righteous, holy, pure, seated, enthroned with the Father. What am I? Seated with him in heavenly places. What am I in this world? Absolutely pure, absolutely blameless, absolutely righteous. Not in your sight, because you're full of judgment, but in the sight of God. I'm just messing with you. You're not like that. Isn't that good to know? I get, I get so troubled when I got believers who are saying, I hope I make it, Pastor. Why? That's the beauty of our faith. We don't hope we make it anymore. We know we make it. All those other faiths where I hope I did enough, that's not how our faith works. I know he did it all. So 
My walk is not do, do, do. My walk is in the revelation of it's done, it's done, it's done. Who am I? As he is, so am I in this world. Which means not just in righteousness, but I'm also a dispenser of heavenly favor everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. All right, let's wrap it up. Re revelation 12, 10 to 11. Who accused them? The devil comes and the devil tries to accuse them before God day and night. But he has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their own lives even unto death. You see, has the blood been shed? What do you say about that? Has the blood been shed? What do you say about that? You say amen, you say amen, you say according to his word let it be unto me you say the blood of jesus if the enemy comes to you and says you're a failure this what do you say i plead i plead ignorance <laughs> i plead i don't know please be nice to me well you know what you plead the blood of jesus and the enemy he's gotta go i plead the blood i plead the blood i plead the blood the Lord's table. We're going to come to the Lord's table. Have we got any? We got emblems, I think, on the tables. Hopefully you guys have enough because I'm stealing one of yours. Uh, make sure you got one. And please, do you guys not have any? Just steal some from another table. You guys need some? Can somebody help these guys up up here? They need some? All right. Now listen, if you didn't live so far today, pure, spotless, and holy, don't take one. No, that's not true. That's, see, see, that's... That's just rubbish. Isn't that rubbish? You know, it's the table of the Lord. And you know what? Especially if you screwed up today. Especially if you yelled at your kids on the way out the door. Especially if you got angry because your wife slapped her wrist and said, it's time, it's time. <laughs> Especially you. Come to the table. Come to the table. Come to the table. It's not a call to commiserate his suffering or our sin, but it's a call to commemorate his triumph. It is finished. It is finished, and the Eucharist is his grace and his life. So listen.